Welcome to Arkham Postcast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. We, had, we got a lot to cover today. Uh, I'm excited. We're moving right into Rundeck here, so it should be a good episode. How are you doing over there? I'm I'm doing good. I've been I've been working through this uh, book because of course it's going to be another book review. Um, I've been I've been sitting on it for a while, uh, so I'm I'm interested to 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 go over it and and kind of share what I learned through it. But uh, let's go through some of these articles now. I know the first one that you posted was about uh, book recommendations from Hacker News. So I yeah did you did course. you find a book recommendation in there or were you just kind of looking at the no, I just dumped the whole page out there because we do a lot of book reviews. And guess what I saw out there? I saw this, uh, I don't call, I'll call it a web app this guy built using natural language processing and deep learning. Ooh, AI, everybody. Ooh, AI. <laughs> um, but basically, it's 40,000 Hacker News book recommendations, and then it has little blurbs with each book, and then... Uh, kind of sidebar with the comments on the book and kind of what people are talking about and regarding it. So I don't know if you saw, got to check it out. The first page has a great oh, kind of list got, there. Yeah. So these are all good. I've, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. There's some good books here. So I okay, li- I put well, it out I, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have the lean startup. So that's there. We've, we've already covered that. Um, one of my favorite Neil Stevenson books, Cryptonomicon, uh, Atlas Shrugged, Why We Sleep, very important one. I might actually just go over that as far as like a health thing. Snow Crash, my other favorite Neil Stevenson book. Actually, I like that one because it has like a great how it how it shows virtual reality, how it kind of yeah. Uh, th- anyways, Dune. Um, Wow, this is really cool. I'm I'm excited to look into this for sure. So, Thanks for this. Yeah, he, no problem. Yeah, yeah, I figured we'd do all these book recommendations. I thought I'd toss it out there, just show everybody like, oh, hey, look at this. Look at these book recommendations that, you know, there's a whole list of them out there now. So definitely want to just include that if as a talking point for anything, just as reference. Thought it was an interesting and project. And if anyone has any recommendations from this list of recommendations, uh, hit us up at rcompose.com and we'd be more than happy to, to go over that and and uh, give our hot takes uh, on, on what we find there. Uh, and speaking of hot takes, uh, some, some straightforward news that came out of the ecosphere today was Intuit to acquire MailChimp. Um, so I, I'm trying to figure out if I have any hot takes on this, but I know that we do use MailChimp and uh, even even more relevant is we were talking about how uh, the famous Dan Brown, uh, author of BookSec, had actually started writing his own MailChimp replacement, uh, self-hosted, because he was, he was fed up with what MailChimp did. So uh into it as seen this as worthy enough to acquire um this is part of from what i understand a rash of acquisitions that is kind of going around because of uh hearsay about impending uh impending legislation that's going to make it harder for companies to acquire um i forget where i picked that one up um that was that was recently i read over that uh but but you know here's some tangible evidence of that in action yeah and i've got a hot take on this one it looked like mailchimp was didn't give out equity is kind of what it boiled down to it looked like they were very big uh cash incentive shop um they didn't provide equity to employees so when they uh ended up selling the pie you know the founders and whoever else had equity guess who did not see Mm any of that kind of bonus come in or any of that uh, their shares kind of inflate because they didn't have any the employees so yeah I was trying to find an article on um, business insider uh, about kind of the uproar and if people were leaving or what the status was but 
Um, unfortunately for me, it was uh, blocked by a paywall and it didn't like my ad blocker was on. So I'll, I'll have to follow Oof. up on that one next episode here, but just something to keep your eye on. Um, it didn't look like employees were very happy with this accusation. No, but talking about uh, employees being happy, I know a lot of the uh, employees of Manjaro um, are I mean, they're, they're driven really by the work that they do, right? And, and you can tell that they care about it. I, I love that I actually took a, a big inspiration, um, from like their, their videos, uh, and also Vivaldi's videos that they put out. And, and that's how I kind of uh, synthesized those into our integration discussion, uh, videos that we have on YouTube under the Our Compose, uh, YouTube channel. But, Manjaro and Vivaldi talking about both of those two, they are actually joining forces now, uh, whereas Mozilla Firefox has been the default cho- browser of choice of Manjaro Cinnamon uh, Edition for years. Uh, the same will be replaced by Vivaldi in the upcoming update. Uh, now, this is this actually hits home for me because I use the Cinnamon Edition um, of, of Manjaro. Uh, I found Cinnamon to be a great desktop. I think I switch to it after kind of fumbling around a bit after Crunchbang went away. Uh, that was a open box desktop. So it's, it's a very traditional style desktop, very simple key bindings. It's not like super tiling or whatever, but it, it kind of does everything I needed to. It has a great, it has a default dark theme. This is why I love cinnamon. I always gravitated towards it. I was like, Oh, perfect. Um, and Vivaldi also comes, uh, with a dark theme right out of the box as well. And, uh, I picked that browser up, uh, several years ago, probably not that long ago, maybe two years ago. Uh, and have been using it ever since. Obviously I've talked about it on this podcast before. Uh, and my understanding is that this is their foray to kind of test the waters, uh, into including Vivaldi on the desktop. Now this does ruffle a couple feathers because it is not completely open source. Uh, now they do release a lot of their code, I believe under the M BSD license or MIT license, one of, one of those licenses. Um, so it is, it is open source C, right? And, and a lot of their edits are, you know, their, their sauce is available, uh, but it's not, you know, true open source standard. Uh, so there, there's definitely been pushback about against that as well. You know, this is based on Chrome. So it's still kind of, you have Chrome leading the way in the, the, the browser pack here. But you know what? I cannot say that I have had a better experience by far with any browser than I have with Vivaldi. I've just, I've been so happy with it. And, uh, I just kind of like the fact that it's, it's spreading. I Default mean, it's getting now. this kind of yeah. publicity. Yeah. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I think Manjaro is missing, uh, is, you know, you, you get a Google phone, say, right? You, 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 you get an Android or you get an iOS device or you get, you know, a desktop. Usually, especially for, for Chrome OS, you're going to get some kind of plan with that that gives you free backup, free storage, free, you know, sharing, like a Dropbox kind of alternative, maybe even a free email address if you wanted to, especially with Apple devices. And I don't see Manjaro having that necessarily, right? And I think that's a gap uh, in their offering, right? Uh, they have the hardware, right? They they now are bundling a, a awesome browser, which if this goes well, they plan on expanding. Um, but they just, they just don't have online services that they offer. But Vivaldi does. I was going to say, I thought Vivaldi, I'm pretty sure I have some kind of Vivaldi domain email address floating out there. I thought Vivaldi offered email. Does that sound correct? Am I thinking I know, of something different? I know they do integrate email now. Um, they have a couple different things. I haven't tried that out recently, but I know they have uh, VPN. And I know they have uh, at least integration for, for a whole bunch of different things like bookmarks and sync and stuff like that. Uh, but keep in mind, that's also stuff that Nextcloud can provide or uh, other services, right, that are that are 
on the 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 arc compose suite of tools right uh and and honestly w- the way i work right and and it's it's funny because this is basically two-thirds of the core of my production workflow here it's you know log on to my mandaro desktop like open up vivaldi and log into our compose right and then i i chill there the rest of the day well maybe reddit too but that's that's something else and i i just i just found that interesting that that this is kind of coming to the forefront and uh and and i do see that gap there so i'm wondering if that's not a, a place that they are also looking at um because i know i know a lot of people uh at least people nowadays who are picking up a, a laptop or a phone uh, kind of expect that kind of expect something to come bundled with it and and it doesn't currently so maybe something we can we can look into to offer into those types of communities absolutely filling those gaps mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. did you want to talk here on the open ssl 3.0 release yeah i didn't get a chance to really sift through this uh the, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a major release, you know, three years of development work. Um, they're, they're releasing Opus SSL 3.0. Uh, so there's a nine, been an, I love this, a 94% increase in the amount of documentation that we have. I saw that. Like, that's awesome. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, guys, because we, we need that. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I'll keep harping on this because it's something that's very, very easy to overlook, right? There's a lot of, uh, to open source that is simply not coding, right? There is a lot of the PR. There's a lot of the documentation, the, a lot of the translations, all of this stuff uh, that people can do who don't have the skills to code, who want to contribute yeah. to the community. And it's funny you should say that. I'll tell you what, I don't want to jump too far ahead here. Uh, the Jekyll Project... And in the so news and community updates, uh, the Jekyll Project had one of their members pass away, unfortunately. And guess what that individual did? I don't know if they wrote a single line of code. It was all PR. It was closing out issues on GitHub via strictly, I would say, communication. Their job they was quote, basically PR. Yeah, they, they quote that. here, you know, Ruby not being his forte, he chose to avoid code level changes and instead focus on what he did best, engage with the community. And that is an important part of open source. Absolutely. It's key part, key part of it. You can write the code, but just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to have that community behind it. And what a class act to call that out on the website as well. I mean, it, yeah. It, it could have simply been overlooked. You know, they could have just had a post stickied in the, you know, discourse forum or, or, or what have you. But no, they, they chose to kind of make it public on their blog, um, calling out uh, a, a single contributor that, you know, otherwise, you know, I wouldn't really have known of because I, I really didn't have to interact with him. But, you know, I'm I'm very happy to at least have had him brought to my attention. And yeah, his and, contributions and, and what he meant to the team. And with that, it, it's going to be interesting to see where Jekyll goes. Um, cause they, ha- I don't know if it was mentioned. I don't know. I don't know if this was fact or fiction, but it sounded like they were kind of going into, uh, uh what do I want to call it? Like a maintenance cycle. It sounded like a lot of new code wasn't being written. And now I don't know if this was part of that or if this is just something different, but. It sounded like the project is unfortunately just starting to lose a little steam. So we'll we'll see how it goes here with updates um, with Jekyll. But luckily, a lot of a lot of this, a lot of what you're describing, is uh, the signs of a mature project, right? Because there's there's not a lot of new features that need to be added. You know, they just released the the four dot x. Uh, yeah. train just to 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 fix some of the the glaring things that they were running into and now at this point you know if that's the case then that's a mature project that can step back and say well there's there's not really you know changes to be made and everything still kind of works and and especially for something like this there is you know a, a static site generator 
There's right. not a lot of security updates that need to be applied here, right. luckily. I mean, and that's, that's mainly what you're looking for when you want to see if a project is maintained. So, you know, given that they stay responsive to, you know, security updates, I know right. they... Uh, they have their Jekyll server, so that may be something to to watch out for. But otherwise, there's there's not much that needs to be done if they've determined that it's reached that stage of maturity. Yeah, and even with that Jekyll server, you're serving it usually localhost localhost for development. So it's not you really kind of have to go out of your way to bind it to your to an actual port on your machine for it to be exposed to the exposed and then at that point you're still only exposed to your local network now that's in contrast with php uh, which the last news item here is that php maintains an enormous lead in server-side programming languages so for everyone who thought go or 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 python or perl or java or ruby was the new hotness well looks like php is still hanging up there around 80 percent of websites now keep in mind wordpress is is a very popular web web service out there so i'm sure that's leading the way a lot Um, but you know going back to you know 2010 it has not wavered whatsoever i mean it is just a powerhouse now i pulled this up because we have several applications that we host that are written in php we have camboard we have bookstack um we have a a, probably several others and and you know several in the future that we're considering as well i thought nextcloud was written in php as well yes it is nextcloud is is absolutely written in php yeah it's it's just proven itself to be such a flexible robust language uh is is and if i'm also reading this it's fast too yeah right it's very fast so i found that pretty interesting when i saw that i think it reported i don't know what the stats were that it reported but i just know it reported in a lot faster than everything else i i just don't see a clear contender i mean ruby since 2010 has been on the decline i haven't seen anything spike up to take its spot um, I've, uh, there, there's plenty of new ones that are coming out. I mean, plenty of new languages. People are experimenting, trying to find the new hotness, and that's great. Case, case in point, if if you're looking, if you're looking for some stable work right now, and you know PHP, there's a good chance you're going to be able to find it for a long time coming. Um, and and you know that's that's me as well. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you know Camboard and Nextcloud and say, is this sustainable? You know, and that's that's what we look at when we evaluate service. Right. So like, how's the community? How's this going? You know, is this something that is is going to serve long term needs as well as kind of get the job done? And you know, looking at this just kind of reinforces my my belief in in applications that are written in php it's like yeah we can we can probably maintain this because there's you know with with 80 percent market share there is not going to be any decline in 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 knowledge there so absolutely it's not going away what Uh, is rundeck written in do we know that i i think java it is java it is java you're right you're right it is java yep and i can i can see that by going to the github where they have their 3.4.4 release they do and i'll tell you what it was hot off the press here i think it was released uh yesterday if not two days ago so they didn't even have a page up for security fixes and uh you know release notes for this 3.4.4 when i went to go look i just saw the git github release was out there so i don't have any major news on that i don't know if you wanted to add anything to that community update i just saw it was out there um nothing nothing too tangible to add to it though we're still on the release papadum chartreuse cutlery i i find it i find it meaningless and i don't know why it's included. just a bunch because of random 3. words 3.4.4 3.4.4 is a lot easier to say than papadum chartreuse cutlery i just Regardless, they they do have show notes here. Um, 
or they have, excuse me, they have a release, they have a release notes here. Uh, they talk about expanded cloud infrastructure plugins, uh, new UI based rule set designer, which is kind of interesting. Um, accessibility enhancements with like colors and stuff like that, which I don't, I don't know if, if you've seen this as a, not a trend, but just something that is nice. Every time I have a list of something, I would love it if the background of each list item alternates backgrounds slightly. So you have like the gray and then white and then light gray. And it just makes it so much easier to kind of differentiate. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like that's been something that they've been, they've been looking into. So yeah. Uh, cool stuff with that. And then our last news item here uh, is WordPress, the road to 5.9. Again, this one didn't, there was not too much uh, around this one. It was really around uh, the blocks, which was which were pretty big in 5.8, and they're just continuing forward with more features on those blocks. So discussions are happening. It's good to see the prog- progress is being made. Um, but again, with this one, not not anything real noticeable until we see that 5.9 update. It, it was just a lot, of, a lot of enhancements on 5.8 is what I noticed. Cool. But for our developments, there's quite a bit going on. You want to start with those? You want to jump into some of those? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, the, the two that I wanted to... Uh, look into that I was excited to look into the, the most was uh, pruning the, the full backups and uh, Bitwarden getting some of those, uh, those users re- registered. So uh, we have uh, as part of our infrastructure um, backups uh, snapshots that we take and uh, we, we just kind of let that go. We're just like, take, take snapshots of, of the database and uh, just kind of keep them hanging out there. And uh, I think, Jack, we were looking, we had snapshots back to, like, uh, early 2020. Yeah, I don't think we had any 2019, but we, we, we had plenty of them hanging out there. Uh, so now we're, we kind of we pruned those to the last 90 days because uh, we, don't, we don't need database backups. We already have full backups. Uh, and actually, to that point, our full backups, uh, we, we do in a type of uh, generational uh, style. So we have a, a sun backup, uh, that is like every week. It's a, it's a weekly backup. We have a father backup. That's a, a monthly backup. And then a grandfather backup. That's a quarterly backup, right? Well, the logic that we had written kept killing off the grandfather. And, uh, so, so we had, we had no grandfather backup. <laughs> so we wanted to oh, make no. sure that we, we kept that. Uh, so that was, that was just, uh, Python. And, and it kind of brings up a, a, a bigger, question too about you know code testing uh and and code review and stuff and and just how difficult that really is right especially when you're trying to push through so many different changes and features and functionality right how do you balance that with making sure that what you assume works is is already working and trying to keep up with that making sure that that testing keeps catching you know the issues that that might come up Um, but i i think this was uh practical for us to to manage because you know we are so small at this point it was it was really easy to catch that but going forward having a a a type of uh test battery uh would be something that that'd be definitely a nice to have a definite nice to have Uh, but the the other thing here uh that i was able to to take a look at is uh bitwarden it, it appears in their api change the return value for one of the uh, post uh, functions that I call from user already exists with a capital U to user already exists with a lowercase ah. U. So, and and I, I'm kicking myself because, right, that's, that's yet another thing that can be tested to say, oh, an upgrade broke this. But no, it's, it's something that just came across and I saw that the user wasn't in fact getting instantiated. And I figured, you know, what's going on with this? And, and, and just found that discrepancy. And, and, and really that's an easy problem to solve because I just check for that string. Um, but I just lowercase the entire string before I check it. So I don't care what version it's on. As long as that user already exists string is in that output, I can, I can check it. But, but, you know, that's just, 
not lazy program, but input sanitization, which I think right. is one of the hardest problems. That and naming variables in programming. So. Too hard. Yeah, yeah. Too, and too you, for, you forgot off by one errors. So those are the two oh, hardest off, things. <laughs> <laughs> two errors and an off by one error. But what about uh, getting Rundeck logs into Portal? Yeah, so we those. have those. We have those showing now. Uh, well, it's kind of two things split into one here. So we do have the portal portal showing uh, run deck logs. Um, then we have. Let me take that back. So we have our application. What, what we described last week, I think, or last episode, and it's commands receivable out there, which was able yes. to call the socket. And the socket call was basically streaming input in, and we were able to parse all the data, everything in so real time. In real time. So what this is doing now is a similar function. It's as the app as Portal makes calls out to Run Deck, we're basically able to look at the logs as they're coming in and confirm. Basically, it, it's it's. I would call it feature parity to itself to this command's receivable. So basically, we're able to look at run deck output as we would look at the so the socket output so having this is awesome it's sweet it it works right now so and and what that allows us to do is we have that execution abstraction yeah right? and and what we're able to return with now with both run deck and with commands receivable local execution is the exact same thing so we're able to treat it the exact same that's that's the cool part and I think it's just, you know, we keep talking about it one more step towards going, moving to localhost, moving home. And that's something I was actually working on last night. Uh, I think it was. I spent an hour or two trying to spin up, you know, what, what does it take to spin up a vanilla Ubuntu box, create a brand new, you know, Ansible project, no special group VARs, none of, you know, can I get it to deploy successfully and like access all my services? Um, the answer is yes and no respect respectively. <laughs> I, was, I was able to, to get it to deploy uh, the, the, the services. However, I found out pointed to example.com. So that's not Oops. going to work. <laughs> I will be <laughs> addressing that uh, going forward here, but a lot of the changes that we've made recently really, really help us get, uh, to this point where it's going to be a vanilla, you can install this on a vanilla server without any of, you know, our backup scripts or our calls out to run deck or, you know, this should be self-sustaining, right? With, you know, the added sweetness on top uh, that we can bring with a command and control server uh, on the, on the actual compositional uh, on, on our company side. Which I'm excited for. And speaking of, Automation. Speaking, I mean, of, I say that word a lot. I don't I know, know if I said that recently. Would you call it? Would you even go so far to say front end automation? What we're talking Ooh, about today. Are you talking about like a a front end for our automation? That indeed is what I'm talking about. So, speaking of automation, speaking of front end automation, we're jumping into our next service here, which is Run Deck. Now, I know we've done an overview of run deck before but i did want to cover kind of briefly why you would use this and then i really want to jump into projects which are what i would describe tip of the iceberg it's it's that you can get so deep with run deck so uh i'm really excited for today because there's actually just a ton of information jam-packed on projects so i didn't want to cut anything out i wanted to do just kind of one uh, a little brief overview again uh, to reintroduce the topic and then jump into projects. Okay. Enough talking about what I'm going to do here. <laughs> going to do it. Uh, so run deck, as we described before is run book automation feature point. You basically are giving anyone self-service access to operations capabilities that only your SMEs could perform. Andrew would know this. And I know this, if he asked me to go out and run the playbooks or the comp compositional role on an instance, I would be absolutely clueless. Thankfully, what he has done is created a, a project and in the project, we have our jobs and I'm able to just run these jobs to spin up my instance, you know, test the code I need to test 
And then, you know, if I need to change a variable, I can run compositional role on it and it'll fix it. And then I'm able to tear down the instance without having to do anything too crazy. So it really provides in our instance here, me, the ability to do something on my own rather than having to become a full blown expert on everything we have, you know, being an expert at two things at once, essentially, I can focus on what I need to focus on. He can focus on what he does. And th this front end provides that ability. So with Rondeck, basically what you're getting is commands, jobs, you can run on nodes. Uh, and then projects is basically this top layer. So projects are a place to separate all your activity. So first thing you do when you deploy an instance is you're going to have to create a project because you can't just run in kind of I'll say null land. You can't run jobs or executions out of nowhere. So you have to have a home for all this, pl all these places where you can view activity and, um, you know, what, what's, who's in that environment, what, what jobs are available in that environment. Yeah. Can I, can I read your little intro here? I really liked how you, how you put it. So, uh, run deck documentation. I'll tell you that right there. Came right from the documentation. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're really good. So so I'm not gonna feel bad if stealing your thunder because it's not even your thunder to begin with. All right, there we go. So here we are. Uh, a project and stop me if you want to to kind of elaborate a bit. Yeah. A project is a place to separate management activity. All run deck activities occur within the context of a project. Multiple projects can be maintained on the same run deck server. Projects are independent from one another, so you can use them to organize unrelated systems within a single Rundeck installation. This can be useful for managing different teams, infrastructures, environments, or applications. Everything falls under a project. I, I think I'd mentioned that. But essentially with these, you're able to provide customization per team, you know. So you have an enterprise at this. You could have a small team or a mid-sized team. And you just need people to be able to do separate functions based on their job, you know, based on what they do. And you're not going to provide, you're not going to want to provide everybody with access to everything. So what you're going to do is break it out based on projects, you know. And I think you had mentioned it before uh, at your job. It's kind of like a self-service console. You know, I need to reset a password on a server. I need to reset a password on this account. Well, Rundeck can kind of provide that ability where you just log in. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'm not a part of the admin the admin group or whatever. So I'm not going to be able to add my keys to every server per se, but I can go in and I can reset my password or, Hey, hey you know, I need to do this on these sets of servers. So I don't know if I'd split it up logically per application team. I don't know if you've seen that before on any instances where each team kind of gets their own project. It It's very, it can be architected a lot of ways is what I'll say there. There's a lot of options when it comes to projects. You can split them up, you know, based on team. You can split them up based on, I don't want to say access level, but you can get... It's it's very similar to, to Camboard where it's it's very open. It'll allow you to do whatever you want to do, uh, and it can get really complex or it can be really simple. Yeah, just depends on how you want to do it. And then speaking there, I love it. I think you, you look at Run Deck and it does one thing and it does one thing pretty well. Right. It, it, I look at it and I go, wow, this is really simple. I say to myself, this is a simple application. At the end of the day, it really just runs. It sounds dumb, but it really just runs program. It, it runs scripts. It runs programs. It runs jobs. And if you look at it, that's what it does. And it does it well. So uh, within projects, you're able to create, I'm, I'm just going to go kind of walk through here, creating a project, uh, and some of the other functions, um, like get configuration, which I thought was really cool. Archiving a project, you know, deleting a project and re-uploading a project if you needed to restore one, but basically getting started with creating a project, you're going to need a name, obviously. Uh, and then you can add label description. And then you kind of get into the, so obviously those are kind of defaults. You, you kind of expect to see those. What Rundeck provides is more granular control, which I thought was awesome. I didn't realize this when starting, when starting Rundeck and, you know, running an instance, the granularity that's available when you configure it. So basically it has a couple tabs here. Uh, execution cl history cleaning, execution mode, user interface, default node executor, and f default file copier. 
So I'm just going to briefly walk through these. Um, stop me if you've got anything you want to add or anything you know you find interesting or you I, I know you've set up a couple uh projects before but you know it's always good to add it add in your own hot take basically uh so execution clean history i didn't know if we used this yes yeah so this is what we were talking about yeah this is what we were talking about earlier and and the really cool thing about this because when i went to set it up i was looking through all right let me set the, cause here they have the days, the minimum executions to keep the maximum size. And I'm like, all right, well now I just got to estimate and how much do I want right. to keep her? But it comes with all the defaults set, uh, including the schedule to clean the, the, the history, like the, the, the every job, day at yeah, midnight there. Yeah, yeah. Every day at, at, at midnight. And so all I had to do was click the enable and I had sane defaults to work with. So I thought that was really nice. I didn't have to go in there and take an tweak it, yeah. guess, of, you know, uh, what do I, what I want to keep, you know, every, everything's just kind of defaulted for me. 60 days, um, minimum executions, maximum 50, size yep. of deletions. I'm like, all right, cool. I don't have to worry about that. Let me just run with those. Yeah. And I didn't realize it, that this was even available. I thought, so when you said a uh, couple episodes back, I thought you were going in and clean, actually cleaning out run deck logs and run deck information. So I thought you were actually going in and you had a custom job to go wipe, wipe data. And I had that in my mind. I was like, Oh wow. It's going in there. You probably got the, uh, you can set the default file settings. Uh, I forget where, but you can set where the project stores on your local computer. And I thought you were quite literally going into that, uh, folder searching for the executions <laughs> I don't know if it was a date. I don't know if it's stored as a data. I'm trying to think now if it's stored as a database or actual files and going in and wipe. Yeah. Wiping that. Not, I, re, I honestly thought you were doing that. I really did. I didn't realize you just, uh, yeah, let me just enable this and keep the, keep the same defaults. So yeah, no, it's, it's baked right in, which made my job super easy. Yeah. And it's a sweet feature. I didn't realize it's out there. It saves, saves on storage. Absolutely going to save on storage. Uh, now it might bite you eventually uh, if you're looking for something way back, but in reality, you yeah you have archives, you have backups. You're gonna have something else after 60 days. 60. I mean, maybe I, I think one quarter is realistically as far back as you're gonna want to go to see execution history. I I'm not gonna need that anytime. Go soon. back, right? No. Um. Yeah. With that being said, awesome feature. Uh, the next one here is the execution mode. Uh, so you can, and I thought this one was kind of weird, honestly. I didn't toy around with it as much uh, in the job function, but you can enable and disable execution now. So with this being said, you're basically able to, I, the way I kind of understood this was delay jobs instead of kicking them off at the start immediately once they're created, it kind of holds on starting them enabling. So it holds on starting them automatically so i i didn't know if you'd mess mess with this one seen this one touch this one i i assume both are configured for to be unchecked meaning they just run once they're started i mean i can certainly see where this comes in handy especially if you consider like having a maintenance mode or maintenance window kind of yeah. thing you yeah. just want to say hey we're gonna have downtime for no, an hour no i'm gonna pause jobs. all executions we're, we're just gonna do that we're gonna do our thing and then i'm gonna unpause all the executions and open the floodgates go for it run yeah. run yeah. run deck run that no, should have I been the title <laughs> of the episode <laughs> run run deck run i'll save that, that for next episode okay that, that, that i was fun. gonna say i was gonna say <laughs> uh so that's out there that's an interesting that's an interesting one I, you don't think about that one the next one here is the user interface uh configuring it for a project now I didn't see this. You can display a readme and a message of the day. I, I th <laughs> if you ask me, I think it's a little bit fine. What do you? But what are you going to do with a readme, like on the front of a, a like a a project page? So it's out there. It's available. I think <laughs> I, I, I I don't know on that one. Uh, I'm it's, sure you're able yeah. to programmatically set the message of the day though uh, via the API, which is actually their API is pretty extensible almost it's like they built an api and then they built a front end for the api so realistically kind of everything i've gone over with the ui settings has an end has an endpoint 
to configure. So you can send it as JSON. It little side tangent. It's their API. Their API is nice. That's what you're used to working with. I mean, you're you've been you've been making calls out to there. You, you're 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 deep into that. Yeah, uh, but the, you know there are UI settings out there, uh, so you can. When you open jobs up, you can look at all the jobs. You can look at none of the jobs. You can look at, I think it has, you can look at, you know, some, I'm trying to look here. The job expansion level is one of the options. You can collapse them or you can expand them. I, by default, I, now this is project default. Uh, they are collapsed, if I'm not mistaken. Or no, they're expanded. What am I, what am I talking about? It, so when we open up our run deck instance that we have, uh, by default, we have groups of jobs, and all of those are expanded. So when you open up Rundeck yes. for us, everything is all the jobs that we have in that project are going to show up. And and what you're talking about is the list of jobs. So like Correct. I'll, I'll, every Correct. every single Correct. script that we have that we can run is kind of displayed it for show, us, it, right. rather than because and and. I don't know if we're going to go into this today, but you know, everything in the project, uh, in, in the jobs at least. And so I guess that that'll be when we go over jobs, we'll, jobs. We'll take a look yeah. at that. But you know, uh, everything is in a tree like structure. You can just, you have, you have different, uh, folders or directories or whatever you want to call them, uh, that can be expanded or closed or hidden or whatever. So just, just, yeah, we, we do have everything, um, uh, expanded so that, we have that, and you can set the the depth too. Now, where that would be handy is say you have, oh, let's say you have development and operations, right? So you have two top level segments, and then under development and operations, you have all of the teams, right? And then under the teams, you have all of their jobs. Well, I would probably want to set the level of expansion to two. Right. So I would want to see um, all of the the devs and operations and then I would want to see all the teams one level. So that way, that way, everyone, when they log in, they see all the teams and then they go to their team and expand only their team. And then that pulls up all of their jobs. Um, So something like this. Now, we are very small in that we really only have jobs for us. So it doesn't make sense for us to divvy it up like that. Um, but, but you can, you can, if you want to. So it, it, it's just little, little tweaks like this that make it a, a nice project to work with because you can set these little things and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that'd be, that'd be nice. Or at least it's nice to know that I can, I can do this if I need to. It's extensible, right? Yeah. You have it, you have the, the options there. You don't have to use it. And that even goes into this next one, the node executor. I was really looking at this one because I found this one very interesting. I didn't know how it kind of operated. So the node executor settings deal with how commands are executed on remote nodes. Uh, and then note, the one thing I found interesting is you can just run them local. And I think that's what we do. We end up doing for a lot of our scripts. Exactly. And then calling Ansible playbook to run it on the remote host via host file. So I found that one very interesting that... I think by default it leaves it as SSH, um, but there are, I think, seven or eight options out here. SSH local, SSHJ, SSH, stub, scripts execution. There is an Ansible ad hoc mode, ad hoc node executor that I saw out there. Uh, well, what's really interesting is that Rundeck is meant to be used as an agentless it's it's basically meant to be used as ansible where it is connecting yeah. to all the nodes over ssh and running the commands that we're executing you know that we're specifying here on the remote nodes we don't use it like that we just use it to run ansible to locally run and then let yeah. ansible do the thing do that um now that brings up an interesting question is you know if we have an inventory of hosts that we manage do we say let's have Rundeck remote out to those hosts and run commands receivable locally on those hosts? Right. Like so, there's there's options that we have with Rundeck in ways that we can use it. You can use it as this thing that kind of spiders out onto you know and manages all of the the, the instances or servers or um or firewalls or you know the Windows boxes or whatever it is out there that you need to talk to um, or do you just want to run scripts locally that do that remote 
uh, that 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 handle the networking for you. Um, so it's it's got plenty of different ways to to do its magic, and I love it. It's it's just what I need. Yeah, and so going from the executor, where are you going to run the files from? Is the next question, right? And I found this one interesting. So this uses, you know, it's the same situation with the executor as you know copying files. It's how do you want to get them there? basically is what it asks you. Now, obviously, if you're running it local, you're not going to have to worry about that because guess what? What you want to what you want to run is just going to run locally. You're not going to have to worry about it. But this uses... So the copying files uh, uses... So I, I had to include it here. Uh, it's going to copy it over to C Windows temp on Windows systems and then just the t- slash temp folder on, you know, I want to say... Linux, I'll just say Linux based systems. Um, but another cool feature, honestly, and it, it pairs nicely with S, SSH there. Uh, I don't know if you're able to see it, but basically you can set uh, the SSH key right there. So that's the IDR I say that you're going to use. And then you're going to have the public key out on the other server there. And then it's just going to be able to copy files how you want. Now, I was also looking because I, I, I didn't know. I said to myself, well, what if I don't want to copy it to temp and, you know, or see Windows temp? Where can I copy it? And there is, it's not shown, but there is a way to set the uh, exact location where your files you're copying are going to go on the and remote that's- server. That's something else that I found out about Rundeck as I've been kind of working with it is that if it's not in the UI, uh, there you may be able to set it in one of the configuration options. Totally. Because there's a ton of things totally. behind the scenes back there that are also configurable that they just don't expose in the UI. And you're like, well, there's so much more here that I can deal with. And I, I'm not going to jump into any of them at all, but the plugins too. They're so yeah. extensible, and they're a. I, I want to say like, there are million. And they're not millions of them, but they're 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 out there. If you want, yeah. if you need some kind of plugin, it's probably out there. Someone probably had the same exact need for this, and you're probably gonna find it. And so. you can write new plugins in Python, Perl, I believe, and and probably I would I would assume a plethora of other languages, but I I know for sure Python, and. That would be something that that should be uh, like I I I know people who have written Rundeck written, plugins yeah yeah and they're like it's you know you just follow the template and it's incredibly it easy I'm like all right cool just package it up upload it to the Send server it and off and, you go yeah yeah and it's funny you should say that it because I think the Git configuration was initially a plugin before it became default uh, I was trying to find the history of it. This one's awesome. This one's very cool. I if if there's something out there maybe for Q4 here, it's a uh, git configuration with the projects because I didn't realize it, but you're able to import and export the project as a git repository. So I I'm I'm just going to say it out here right now. I know we have everything in Rundeck out there. I know we have backups for it, but it would be nice to have like a change management for each of the jobs and the project as a whole itself just because you get to see all right what's you know what is changing what's going on within the project and and not only that but you would you would also be able to see or you uh, you would also be able to manipulate if I want to change one thing across all of them I don't have to go into them one at a time I can do a real simple sed command and be done for the day. Push it and then just say, hey, you know, do an import via Git. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, I did go through kind of the process for export and import. Uh, I didn't do it on our instance, but it's pretty simple setup. Uh, essentially, it needs, I, I think it uses HTTPS um, or SSH, I want to say. I, I, I'd have, I know it was asking for authentication, Um I believe by default it was trying SSH, but I know that there may have been an HTTPS option for exporting and importing it. And, you know, you set the Git repo, essentially. It says S- set up SCM, uh, but it's Git. So 
uh, I was thinking, I, I, for some reason, SCM yesterday and SVN, the other kind of software version, what software version software that's out there, or it was in my brain. So uh, no, it does use Git, but uh, another great feature, cool feature that's out there. And then, you know, maybe you don't want to use Git to export. I say export, it's... I, you can use Git to track, is what I'll say. But really, there is another option for archiving a project, which I think would be the better way to go. Um, obviously, Git's going to allow you to provide you that granularity, and you're going to be, be able to view it all in text, which is actually pretty nice. But archiving it is going to give you that ability to download it, pull it down, and say, okay, um, you know, what's the project? What do I want to include in the project? Uh, you know, what's coming down with it? And you get the feature. Basically, you're pulling down everything in the project uh, is what it comes down to. You can even have the option to include webhook auth tokens, which I would hope they secure them. But assuming that is there, I bet they do not. So um, I, I don't have much to say about archiving a project. You know, if you need to pull it down, you can. If if you need to if you want to back it up without backing up the entire instance, it's available. And then, you know, right on the exact flip side is how do you want to load your project in? And I found this pretty interesting. You can basically regenerate UUIDs for jobs, and you have a whole lot of settings around, you know, what you actually want to import from the project, or if you want to just say, you know what, I'm not going to import this part of the project, or I don't want to import this. Uh, so. You know, ACL policies I know are important. So say someone had like a template uh, pr project that they had out there to, you know, like, all right, I'm going to, I want to be able to add a user in uh, LDAP or whatever. And it's like, okay, I'm just going to import this project into my run deck instance. I want to be able to run it, but I don't want to use their ACL policies. I'm just going to use my own because I have, I'm configured the way I want them configured. So again, pretty granular with this, uh, with being able to, export and import projects in the way you want. And then the uh, last setting here, or the last option is, brings a tear to my eye if you would like to delete your project. If you if you want to end up deleting it, guess what? There's an option out there to do it, so. And and that's that's been used uh, a lot uh, on my end, definitely when I'm testing stuff out. Um, or, you know, figuring out, cause I had to figure out all the project settings and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do something on our production project, you know, right. where, where everything's working, right. right? let me not experiment there. So in creating a new project, you know, as you went over, very easy to do, was able to set that up, test it out, um, migrate it over to a new one and just simply get rid of the project when I was done. But yeah, all in all, if it's, it's the place to start. Uh, if you're going to go with Rundeck. Um, so a lot more features and conversations to be had around nodes, jobs, activity, executions. So we're just getting started. Would you would you say that there's a lot that we still have to learn about Rundeck? I would absolutely say that. <laughs> because I just learned I just learned seven laws about learning. Well, not quite, but it's it's actually seven laws i believe about teaching uh, and that's what but, i thought too when i was re reviewing the show notes here yeah yeah it's it it it, it is it is um so w this was originally i believe for seminary teachers right so people who are training to become pastors uh so there's there's a lot about um in seminary school, which looks like any other kind of college, right? Um, and then a lot about uh, giving sermons, right? So, so, so delivering sermons, um, and and a lot of that. So definitely, uh, definitely a book uh, fairly grounded in Christian theology, right? So there's there's a lot of that in there, uh, and and a lot spills over to right uh, to to project management, uh, to really just helping other people, right? and and ways to 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 convey a message right so i was i was really excited to to go through this um i took out uh, quite a bit uh from it I, I i think the three 
laws that I highlighted here that I wanted to go over really stuck out in my head uh, slash also reinforced stuff that we've talked about previously. So I'm going to go over that. I, I like to compare this book. I like to compare this book to How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? It it had a very similar type of vibe to it, um, a lot longer. It was like 400-some pages. Uh, could definitely have used the editor, I think, in some parts. Um, but it, 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 it followed good form, right? It always anchored its chapters by starting out with a story. Um, That's good. But then it, it, it really went into a highly regimented type system. So each, each law had two chapters. Uh, and the first chapter had three main sections. And the third section had seven points in that section. Um, and it always kind of followed that formula, which on one hand is good because you can kind of always know what's coming. Uh, but on the Did other hand, get it boring? feels it because you're it repetitive. Yeah. Was, it was, it was dragging on. Uh, and it, it definitely covered different aspects. Uh, but it, I think a lot more, there was a lot more crossover, I think, uh, than the, the author had intended. So a lot of the law started blending together at the end because there's, there's just, so much you can do to really separate right. a topic entirely you know it, it kind of all feeds back on itself it, so i can't i can't fault him for trying to separate it out um it just with a highly regimented style it was very obvious uh but the the two chapter setup and and knockout punch like i said it was it was interesting i i have here but it was less of a one-two punch and more like a repetitive sequence of jabs yeah just a bunch of little jabs so there were a couple things that stuck out to me, and I'll kind of uh, walk through those here. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to go through three of the laws. The first law uh, was actually law number one, the law of the learner. Uh, so the, the main point in this section was that the teacher's responsibility is for the student's learning. Um, and that's sure. student's apostrophe uh, S. So, so the learning of the student. So... There were, there were a lot of examples in that chapter about the teacher's responsibility not necessarily just being summed up as far as like quote unquote covering the material. Uh, there was, there was a lot of it's your responsibility, uh, to make sure, ensure that the student learns the material, like whatever whatever it takes that is actually your responsibility as a teacher Uh, and he actually pointed out in hebrew that the root of the word teach is the same as the root of the word learn so they they share that same root you know he kind of goes into how the prefix is like to cause learning it's like teaches to cause learning it's it's really cool stuff really cool stuff just the way that it got conceptualized uh through the ages uh and then the uh the maxims here which is kind of the the meat and potatoes of the, the first chapter and the, the one, two punch here. Uh, two of them stuck out to me. One is that teachers are, are responsible because they control the presentation. Sure. And he broke the presentation up into three sections, the subject and the style and the speaker. So the, the subject uh, is what you're going over. Ultimately as a teacher, you do have control over what you go over. Like that's, right. that's plain and simple. Like you can diverge from what you plan to go over. You, your past self does not have to hold your, you know, pre your present self hostage. Uh, you can, you can always choose what, su- what subject you're actually going to be tackling. Uh, secondly is going to be the style. And I liked this. What stuck out of my head is they're like, all right, you can use tone, inflection, hand gestures, you know, eye contact, yada, yada. Yeah, I'm sure. like, all right, cool. Like speaking. And he's like, then you can also use whiteboards. You can use origami. You can use, uh, you know, physics problems. And I was like, oh, so like every whatever like, you want like right really expand your style to everything that is available to you and and he does kind of go through some some specifics on on what works for him and and uh, one of the things is, is definitely hand gestures and and being engaged yeah. like that so uh very very fun to to see him talk through that uh and then also just you know you're 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 the speaker right so y- y- you you cannot divorce yourself from what you're teaching right so make oh. sure you're yeah it gets right? boring it gets boring when people do that if they do that yeah yeah you can tell when when teachers i'll say divorce themselves from the material you know they they either don't want to be there they have something else going on that you know they just 
aren't interested in the material and you just know and then it, all the material just goes over like it's wafting over everyone's head wafting yeah, because over. you're you're the one that they're looking for to teach them and right. you you are responsible for causing learning in them and if you aren't even caring about it how are you supposed to cause learning good luck right right yeah uh, and and that kind of brings us to the second maxim which is that teachers exist to serve the students. I like that one. Um, he has a he has a really good example of uh, him getting ready for his, his very first sermon after seminary. You know, got hired on as a, a pastor of the church. He's he's getting ready to go up, and he's just nervous. He turns to the senior pastor and says, "I'm I'm so nervous." You know, I, and and the senior pastor kind of looks at him. And he's like, "Don't be so prideful. Don't be so self conscious." And you know, he's like, "What? What are you talking about?" Yeah. He's like, "Look, it, it, the minute you concern yourself with meeting the needs." of the other people there, you're not going to be nervous because you're going to be more concerned about them getting what they need. And, and you're going to be pushing towards, towards that. You're going to be, you're going to be throwing everything that you have at that problem. You're going to be putting your best foot forward and, and, and overcoming every kind of obstacle that you have instead of being nervous and self-centered and prideful and stuff like that. And he's like, look, your, your job here is to serve the people who you are causing to learn. So I, I really like that, that point. Um, and one of the, the ways that he was talking about that he, he used, uh, practical, um, ways to, 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 to cause this to happen, uh, was altering your style, uh, regularly according to each situation. Um, once again, uh, going, falling back on, on a story he had, he was, uh, at a, I forget if it was a conference or like an after whatever, but he was, he was in a, a, a more casual situation, uh, around a lot of other people in his, in his situation, uh, along with just kind of regular uh, layman of the church, just kind of hanging out. Um, he saw a, you know, slouched over, dejected young man, you know, kind of yeah. walks over and asks, you know, what's going on? He tells him all, all these problems that he, he's, he's having. Uh, he's like a, a junior uh, pastor, you know, younger, younger pastor. He's trying to serve, but really getting frustrated with, with, uh, some of the, the differences he's, he's had with someone else. And, and, and the author just, you know, relating it. I just, I sat there quiet, listened, you know, kind of made them, made the young man feel heard, you know, kind of, uh, counseled him through that in, in that type of a way. Uh, and and the young man was able to to leave and and know the steps that Walk he needs yeah, to take. Needed yeah, to yeah, he 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 had that resolution. He was able to come to a resolution at the at the end of that. He resolved to go and and fix the problems that he had. Whereas uh, his wife immediately after that calls him over uh, to a couple who are arguing and it gets kind of heated and and the husband is just over the top and belligerent and and, and bloated and, and just, you know, all puffed up. And he's like, well, I'm, I can't be, you know, gentle and understanding and, you know, uh, sympathetic and, and counseling with this man. He's like, I got up in his face and like was started poking his chest. And, you know, I, I took a wow. risk. He's like, I took a calculated yeah. risk matching my style according to the situation. Because if, if he wasn't matched by someone who was brave and bold enough to show him that, look, this is, this is really not acceptable. Like, and, and that's, that's what the guy needed at the time. And he was able to, to handle that situation appropriately by changing his style to, by altering his style, uh, according to the, to the situation. Uh, and, and neither of those has anything to do with teaching in a classroom setting or Not giving a all. sermon, right? right? But you, you start with this mentality and it, it kind of pervades as you go out into the world and, and how you manage these interactions, especially, you know, if you present yourself at, at a level of authority, right. Um, right. Um, or, or, you know, as an expert on something, right. You're, you're always able to, to kind of teach others. Now that's not to say that you can't also learn from others because uh, you absolutely can't, but in, in this way you can, you can you can apply those same uh, style altering uh, points to to different situations, uh, and then just the other topic is don't let them be bored. Uh, like if they're bored, right. like I mean, what is what is the number one complaint about going to school? Is that it's boring? Boring. It's yeah, boring totally. for everyone. It's boring yeah. for the gifted kids. It's boring for the the kids who are struggling. It, it's it's just boring. So so don't let them be bored. And there's there's plenty of ways how how to do this. Like I said, this this book is very very into giving practical advice. So much so that I did not get 
I did not get three quarters of it just seeping into to my head. Fair enough. In, yeah. In fair one enough. reading of it, but uh, there's a there's a lot of good good points in there uh, about not being bored and and how not to bore. Uh, but to sum up the chapter, uh, the essence is this: uh, three words, cause to learn. The teacher should accept the responsibility of causing the student to learn. Gotcha. And that's a good example. That's a great example. Really, a teacher who enables someone to do more, do better, do research on their own time has really, I'd say, done their job at that point. Uh, They really kind of took it upon themselves to, I'd say what, get the student curious about the subject, get them to look into what it is, get them to look more into how it works. Not not giving up when they don't do that on the very first try. Right. 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 Taking on the responsibility and say, yes, it is my responsibility if at first I don't succeed to try, try again to cause the student to learn because it is my responsibility. Uh, now, the the next law is the law of application. And uh, I I was blown away by this because I, I wouldn't have thought this uh, had not if I had not read this book. So uh, to, to, to give a broad level overview, he had a. Uh, very interesting uh, scenario. He was he was talking about the real value of an automobile uh, being the application of its engine, not being the engine itself. Now, yeah, he goes back to his high school days when he first got his car as a senior in high school. Yeah, you know, at senior parking, and uh, all the cars kind of lined up. Right, they threw in a neutral and just redlined these these cars. You know, so he had all these cars. Just you know, rev in the in the parking lot. You know, he's talking about this incredible surge of fi- power that he felt. You know, how inspiring it was, and how it was worth every drop of fuel that they burned there. Um, because at that point, the automobile was an end in itself to him. At that point, it was it was that status symbol. It was that that um, freedom. But the value, right? And he's like, I wouldn't do that now, as you know, a, a grown man, right? <laughs> But he's like, the real value of that automobile is in the application of the engine, the ability, the actual freedom to go places, not just that uh, the the ideal. Totally. Absolutely. It makes so much sense. I I mean, you have to look at it and do it for you. I I say you can read a million books on, I'll just say programming. Until you sit down and write the first line, you're going to have no idea, right? You have no idea. You don't know how it works until you actually jump into it and do it. And I love the automobile example because, yeah, you can look at an engine block all day, right? You can look at it and go, oh, look, oh, it does this, this. But until you sit down- six cylinder. Yeah, right. Who cares, right? Who cares, right? Until you get in the car and drive it somewhere, it's basically- I'll say it's worth it's what's it doing setting up on you know uh, an engine hoist or whatever it, it's it's doing nothing right you can exactly. learn every part of it but it's the actual application putting your foot to the gas watching it do its job and move you forward without having to walk or use a horse that is actually where you're taking away from it and an application therefore I mean it relates directly to to wisdom. Uh, to, to transformation and to maturity, right? Because, I mean, you're going to get all that with experience, right? And and you're only going to get those with experience. And, uh, you know, being able to teach application is able to, you know, have someone else learn from the lessons you had. And uh, I think the Rework podcast uh, just put out a, a new episode as they're going through the book. Um, it is entitled, Learning from Mistakes is Overrated. Right. So learn from someone else's mistakes, I think, is the takeaway of that. Okay. So what you what you want to do is, is you know, if you're able to teach application, if you, you have real world application, right, that's able to teach wisdom, teach maturity. You know, that's that's able to do that without, you know, falling on your own face yourself. Uh, there was uh, also a great quote, I think, by uh, D.L. Moody. He said the Bible wasn't given for our information, but for our transformation. Yeah. And that's that's uh, directly talking about a- a- applying the lessons that you learn to your life. Because if you don't apply them, if you don't do stuff with it, it's worthless. Right. There's a it, there's an old Ritz Mullen song. Um, he says, uh, "Faith without works is like a song you can't sing. It's about as useless as a screen door on a submarine." 
I like that one. <laughs> so that's a that's a classic one. I like that one. Uh, so as, as far as the maxims go, he says uh, application is a responsibility of the teacher. Once again, taking on that personal responsibility. Um, often the hope of the teacher is to see the teaching applied, uh, but uh, less often do they take it upon themselves to detail out that self same application. Right. So if if your teaching foundations and your teaching foundations and your teaching foundations and then you're like, all right, now go forth and apply like you haven't you haven't taught them how to apply. That's you just helpful. taught them the right. You just taught them the principles. The principles right. are, are not going to help them go out into the world and help their neighbor. They're not going to help them go out in the world and, and preach the gospel. This is this is something you actually have to teach them as a teacher. You have to teach them not only why they're doing it, but how to do it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, this this was my biggest takeaway here of the book, I think, bar none. So the the other maxim here is that application and information should be balanced. Now, when you think of balance, you think of like teeter totter or, you know, the j- right. scales of justice or right. whatever, you right. know, so, so right. stuff is, stuff is, is, is balanced like that in, in perfect, uh, you know, ratio. But what is that ratio? Right. So, uh, the, the author relates how he first uh, started looking at different sermons and saying, well, is application really necessary? Right. So he, he started going through, uh, he picked out some top preachers of his day and then top preachers kind of throughout history. And he was taking a look. He actually said he, he broke out. He had it transcribed and took like an orange highlighter and highlighted every place that they had application yeah. versus every place that they had foundation. And he found, quote, that there was significantly more application than content. Right. Or foundation. I was like, that's weird. I it makes have, sense, I though. Really? Really? I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah, it, it, it starts to, right? So then he went to the New Testament, some of the, the, you know, James, some of the other letters. And, uh, he, he found that, you know, none of them really drop below 50 50, you know, content and, and application. And then he took a look at some of Christ's discourse, right? So you look at the Sermon on the Mount, the Upper Room discourse. He's like, you know, Christ was a master at application. Like totally. he, he just kept he kept doling it out, just yeah. time after time. Uh, and and he's like, well, wh- why is this? Why is this all coming together like this? And why is why is application so heavy? And he said the takeaway here is to not let general principles morph into lists of rigid laws. Right? As soon as you start forming these these foundations and and make the foundation into the only thing you focus on and, and, and the, the application itself being the studying of that foundation, it becomes a, a rigid law. You, you can't morph to the situation. You can't, you you're can't stuck. change you're your stuck st- following yeah. whatever's written down. Yeah. You can't change your, your style, you know, when you have to uh, change your style based on, on a different s- situation. A need, right. You're, right. You're gonna- Matching a need, right. You're stuck. You're just like, Oh, well, I only have, a law written down for this one application of what I'm doing, I can't morph into any other situation. I'm just kind of locked in. And that's why a lot of this is application driven because when it's application driven, you can see how the same principle is applied in different scenarios. And then as a part of wisdom, right? Wisdom, I'd say if, if anything is synthesizing all those different applications together and says, all right, given this context, I know of all these other scenarios, right? Which, kind of approach is going to fix this this application that i'm trying to to use right now right and and then use wisdom to synthesize that and put that into practice um so i thought that was very very interesting that application is kind of the bulk uh of of really what's coming through and all these 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 sermons and discussions and all these teachings uh is that a lot of it isn't let's lay out doctrine let's go through first principles right it's well this is just in take this it scenario, this is what works. Apply works you know? right? So, very, very cool there. Um, and and he kind of sums up that chapter in the four words, and he says, "Apply for life change." Uh, so, if the teacher should always teach for the purpose of life change, right? And the only thing that you're going to do, once again, if you let general principles morph into lists of rigid laws you're not going to see life change. Life change is only going to come through application. 
And then you actually said it a couple of minutes ago, but law number five, uh, being the last one that I really wanted to, to cover and, and go yeah. over today is, is the law of need. Uh, and we've talked about this, you know, several different times before. Actually, I want to look through. I'm not going to do think, it right now. But. Is this a quote here? Uh, it says, uh, turns out the fish really do like to eat worms. Is that from How to Win Friends and Influence People? That is that's, the first thing I thought of. I that's was like, what I was thinking. Because they use the same analogy. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. Turns out fish really do like to eat worms. Yeah. And so many people over the course of history have found this out. <laughs> Turns out fishing happens everywhere. And yeah, who would have thought? <laughs> use worms to fish. So <clears throat> fish really do like worms. Uh, they don't just like shiny hooks. Uh, they they are attracted to, to what they like. Uh, and and the, the principles you're supposed to glean off of this is as a teacher, I'm responsible to help my students chase after my content. So this is this is a little bit getting into the practical side of what we covered in the, in the first part, right? So it's your responsibility to cause learning in the student, yeah. right? Or, or whoever you're teaching. And part of, part of causing learning, right, is causing your students to chase after your content. You said it, right? To give them the motivation to go do their own stuff, to, 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 to chase after content, to, to do their own research, to find out their own conclusions. And, the the way you do that is to stir up a need in them. So this is definitely getting more practical. You can see as as we go over. Uh, and there was a there was a a good thing he he pulled here. He had a example of the uh, the woman at the well. Uh, if you're familiar with that story, uh, you know Christ is sitting at the well. Uh, a woman comes up and he immediately meets her need then preaches the gospel to her because he's he's serving her right, right. He's, you're, you're you're serving them you're making sure that that they're in a position to to hear your message right so uh, he said stories of the the gospel so Matthew Mark Luke John show Christ addressing the needs of his hearers in one of two types of ways and you'll notice how similar these are right so he says when the person's needs are obvious immediately seek to meet them. When the person is out of touch with their need, seek to surface those needs and, and then, then meet them. Yeah. Right? So it's it's the same thing but with an extra step, the second the second part. And and we can go back to when we were talking about and and it might just been you and I, but the uh sales fire thing yeah. on uh what what was that? But but we're talking about, you know, how do you how do you help someone uh, understand where where it is that you can help them, right? You have to listen to what they need first. You have to under you can't just push a product onto them. You have to know what's going on with them. Where are they seeing their own kind of exactly? And, or and needs. sometimes sometimes they've uh, chosen to turn a blind eye, or, or or you know maybe they didn't even know that. Uh, something is available to them that's solving a problem or they're solving a problem in a suboptimal way, right? So what you're, you're supposed to do ac according to, to that is, you know, you want to, you want to take it and stretch it, really kind of dig into, all right, what, what is this? What is it causing? How is it causing it? You know, is, is this worth it? You, so, so you're digging into this, right? And, and he, he calls it here surfacing those needs, right? So you're, you're really digging down and, and making sure that, that they're clear. And then you can go ahead and go meet those needs, right? So you, needs aren't always going to be apparent. And, and that's, that's hard to, you know, it's hard to understand in in the core at least of my being because i i think well why are why isn't everyone literally honest with me when i ask them how they're doing today right and right it's like well that's a ritual greeting andrew don't get so you know uptight about it <laughs> but you know people aren't wearing their needs on their sleeves you know especially in, you have in a social to dig media type you kind of yeah. have to dig yeah, yeah especially when, come when to realize. Uh, a lot of a lot of what we're doing when we're interacting online is is putting our best foot forward, right? Especially if you're 
you're close to someone or, you know, you've been trying to, to get to know someone and, and they've been putting their best foot forward, they're probably not going to put their needs out there. They're probably not going to immediately say, right. I really need help in this situation or right. I really struggle with this, right? So that's something you're really going to have to dig and you, it's it's going to be different for every person, right? So you're going to have to adjust your, your approach accordingly and figure out what are you really struggling with in order for me to help you. Right. Uh, and so the, the points of this chapter, right, and the 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 thing you really want to pull out is the need building is, is going to be your responsibility, right? Either as a teacher or I would just expand this to as the friend, as the, the consultant, as the whatever, right? Your responsibility is to build that need, right? It, you know, it, it may be shrouded to them. So you're going to have to paint them a clear picture, right? They may not want to look at it, right? And you got to say, well, look, this is, I can actually tell why this is a problem with you. And I can see it. And, you know, you've, you've told me all of this, right? And it's all stemming from, from what I, I, I think your need is, right? And, and working through that with them. Um, and even expanding that, the second point here is need meeting is the teacher's primary calling, right? So in order to meet your needs as your primary calling, you're going to have to surface those needs. And then meeting them is going to be your, your primary calling. And that's, you know, that's a, the, 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 oh, I forget what it's called, but you know, that's, that's what we're, we're called to do. I mean, we're, right. we're trying to, to serve other people here. Right. And, and that's what almost every company in, in existence, right, uh, is, is purporting to do, at least, you know, serve the needs of the consumer, right, or the, the, the customer. But in reality, whether you're a teacher, whether you're, you know, a, a consultant, whether you're whatever, right, meeting the need of other people is actually helping them. There's so many people out there who say they want to help the world. You want to save the world. You want to, you know, make the world a better place. Well, meet a need. Find a need and meet it. Meet it. It. There is, it, it, it. it doesn't help to just say that and then sit on the couch. They're right. right. Your actual, your primary responsibility, they say as a teacher here, I just say as a human, right, is to meet other people's needs. Point blank. Now, and specifically to teaching here, he goes into need need building and, and need meeting may be hindered by factors beyond your control. Right. And, and that's part of digging that up. And he's saying, you know, what's going on? He, he gives the example of a guy who's uh, sleeping in class uh, and, and he tried everything to kind of like engage this guy and it just didn't work. Uh, so he was he was talking to them uh, after class and he's like, yeah, what's what's going on? And I was like, well, I just took up a second job and we just had a kid. So and I'm like, oh, oh sometimes a wow. dude just needs sleep. Right. <laughs> so. Far be it from totally. me. Totally. Uh, uh, and, and, and he runs it out with this, you know, lessons don't have needs. People have needs. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 we're it makes going sense. back to being, makes... being flexible. I mean, you, you don't have to stick by your lesson plan, right? You don't have to, to stick with the approach that you've carefully constructed, that you've, you've put together, that you've, you've, poured your heart and soul into creating i mean you want something that's actually going to help someone right and and we're trying to do that too right i'm not i'm not doing this because i i just want to talk about stuff i can talk about right. stuff to that wall uh i oh i could probably talk about stuff with you and you know i got i got plenty yeah. of people to talk about stuff with right but we're 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 trying to look and say what what needs can be met what needs are out there right um i see a, a lot that's coming around the bend you know there's i i didn't want to get it into it today but you know there's a lot of talk about four day work weeks yeah there's a lot of talk about you know uh, technological unemployment you know there's there's a lot of needs that are simmering beneath that surface that i want to draw out part of what we do here is is try to have that conversation get a pulse on the the ecosystem and, and see what needs are there right becoming more productive i see open source technology is a lot of what i see right so we're, we're putting this together to to meet the needs of of people who who care about that right um if 
if you care about that, I mean, that's probably how you found the show. Let's be honest. Right. Um, if you either, either that or, or on YouTube, as we're, we keep releasing these videos, uh, making sure that, uh, all these, these things we're, we're trying to get as much out there as we can so that, you know, whatever help we can be, you know, we can, we can kind of insert ourselves into that conversation that you're already having and saying, Hey, let, let's kind of unearth that need and, and, and get you going in the right direction. So the action to take that, the, 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 the takeaway from this is, is going to be go to arcompose.com, sign up for the newsletter. That's going to get you all of the up to date info about what we're covering, what we're doing. Um, all the services stuff we're adding. Out. Yeah. I was going to say services, all the services we're, adding. we're adding. Yeah. Um, and, and all the things that, all the, all the, all the cool things, all the, all the cool things that, that we're doing that are designed to meet that need, right? So if you have a need or if you even just want to talk to us, you know, fill out, fill out the contact form there on, on that site, arcompose.com and, and we'll get back to you. We'll, we'll see what's going on. We'll see if we can't lend a hand. Um, but that's all we had to go over today. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.